Hey geeks, welcome back. Geeks of YouTube, greetings and salutations. Uh, it's been a little bit over a week since my last video, and um, I've heard some people on YouTube talking about um, in order to kind of catch the algorithm, you want to um, put out a video a week. <laughs> and um, monetization is not my goal with this channel, but um, it would be nice, you know. So I've heard I've heard these unicorn stories of like, you know, you only get like 80 views per video or something like that. But then you have one that catches um, it goes viral for whatever reason and it gets like 300,000 views and it's like, boom, you know, you, all of a sudden your, your channel just blows up. So uh, who knows? Who knows? It's uh, it's kind of a late night. Um, it's been a busy day, but I felt like making a video anyway. And um, I don't have any comics to show in this video. I'm going to be talking about books. Um, if you've been watching the channel for a while, you know that occasionally I, I will delve into books. So um, that's going to be the case. I do have some new comics, but I'm going to save those for another video. Um... I bought a few comics last week, not too many, but I went into my local comic book shop to get the final issue of Ronin book two, issue number six, because I had ordered it and it had come in, and so I I, I went in there to buy it. Um, so it is late at night. I'm not using any studio lighting, uh, just a few lamps that I have on here in this room, so... I apologize, the video quality is not going to be that great. I'm doing this on my laptop like I do most videos. Um, and, um, yeah, so, but I just, I had some some books. I thought it would be cool to uh, go through some books. So the books that I read, kind of, a lot of them, I think, kind of do dovetail with, with comics. Um, to me, it's all just kind of the same anyway. <laughs> so, uh Let's get into it. There's a couple. There's a couple of books I've just finished reading, and then there's a couple that I just bought like yesterday. Um, so, this book called *The Visitors* by Clifford D. Simak. Um, I just I like this book so much. I read it in two nights. Um, it's 282 pages, so it's not a monster of a book. But the synopsis here is. Um, a close encounter of the most amazing kind, what looked like a big black box, or monolith, perhaps 50 feet high, 200 feet long, had settled squarely on Jerry Conklin's car. The townspeople of Lone Pine, Minnesota, were the first to see it, and one of them was the first and only human to shoot at it. He paid for his rashness with instant death. I'm kind of giving away spoilers on the back of it, but I'm just reading from the synopsis. Within hours, the public knew something strange had happened and was beginning to face the incredible possibility that the Earth harbored something from outer space. A machine? An intelligent being? There was no way to know. But Jerry Conklin knew. The visitor had scooped him up, held him prisoner for several hours, then let him go. Jerry knew the visitor was a living, intelligent creature. So, um, <clears throat> this book was written in, I think, 75, um, no, 1979. First edition was in 1979. It was originally um, published in a serialized version in Analog Magazine. I, I, I don't know. <clears throat> maybe that was in 79, and I think maybe this, this uh, novel came out in 1980. Um, I've heard there is, there's some differences in the novel from the analog magazine story but this was a I enjoyed this a lot this was a really thought-provoking book uh, I've never read any uh, Clifford Simak before but um, he was uh, recommended to me by way of Jacques Vallee and Alan Hynek <laughs> and so um, who I've never met either one of those gentlemen in person um, but if you know something about the two of them you can probably make the connection as to why this would be sort of a, a recommended book from them. Um, and 
Yeah, I thought I found it to be thought provoking because you, they don't really establish the motive of the visitors in the book. It's kind of left for you to describe. So throughout the entire story, the author is kind of dropping clues as to what the visitors want and what they're up to. But they don't just they don't come out and spell it. You know, and, and it's not it's not your typical alien invasion. There's no laser battles or White House destruction or Los Angeles, you know, with a big, you know, Independence Day laser beam. There's, it's not that type of uh, invasion. It may not be an invasion at all. So uh, this book, you know, it covers a lot of different themes. Like uh, what I found fascinating was like um, like the themes of like um, journalism ethics uh, which now makes sense because apparently um, Simak was was a newspaper reporter um, before he started, you know, writing science fiction. And um, there's a, sort of like a political angle to it as the president and his advisors try to figure out how to, um, you know, deal with this threat. If it's a threat at all, they're not entirely sure at first. Um, and then there's the characters that are kind of closest to the visitors, this Jerry Conklin guy and, and his girlfriend, who's a reporter, um, you know, they've uh, they've probably figured out more about what the visitors want than anybody else. And it really it really leaves the reader guessing as to what exactly their motivations are. So at the end of the book, um, you know, you can kind of piece together for yourself what exactly are these beings up to? These, these, you know, it's as it said on the on the back here. The, these are these are living creatures. This box, this monolith, is actually a, an organic living creature. So, um, how that is, um, you know, they go into detail in the book and describe it. But initially, they think that they're just like machines, you know, and they obviously we see this and we think, well, it's like a monolith from 2001. Well, the people in this book have never seen the movie 2001. It doesn't exist in their reality. So there's nobody pointing at it going, hey, that's a monolith from 2001, a space odyssey. There's nobody, you know, it's kind of like, you know, in zombie movies, like you know, no one's ever heard of a zombie, you know? So, um, so yeah, it was, um, it was a really thought provoking book. I enjoyed it immensely because I kept wanting to read more and more of it to see if they would come out and just like spell it out for me as to like what in the heck do these things want with humanity um I, i'm not going to give away any spoilers as much as i want to because i do have theories as to what the visitors want um i uh i uh posted in, in facebook actually in a there's a science fiction and fantasy book group that i'm in and um i and those people in those groups have read like everything by everybody and I did ask people, you know, if you've read this book, what are your thoughts on the motivations of these beings? And uh, really, nobody really replied. So I didn't want I didn't want to give my own theories because I didn't want to drop any spoilers. But then I saw another group was actually talking about this book coincidentally. You know, more weirdness with your phone and your thoughts and. And there I did share my thoughts. So if you can find my comments, because it was a public group, if you can find my comments on Facebook about this book, then you'll know what I think. Um, this would actually make for a pretty cool movie, I think. Like, like a Netflix movie. What else? I finished reading Honor Among Enemies by David Weber. So um, if you are not familiar with Honor Harrington, um, David Weber created this character, Honor Harrington, and she is a, um, I guess at this point she's a captain. I think she's on her way to becoming an admiral, but she is part of the Manticorn Star Empire. And, uh, they call it the Honorverse, and so in the Honorverse, there are uh, there are no aliens. Um, it's just it's just humanity has uh, expanded and stretched out uh, uh, into wide swaths of the galaxy, uh, and formed a lot of different governments and colonized a lot of different planets. And so, what you have is basically, you know, this sort of uh, 
geospatial, political, socio-political, you know, situation where you have these different empires, and the Manticorn Empire is uh, is kind of a monarchy. It has a queen, and it has, you know, I guess princes and princesses and and that kind of thing. And and the Royal Manticorn Space Navy keeps the peace and fights the wars with the other competing star empires. Um, such as the Solarian League and um, the uh, People's Republic of Haven, I think, is the other one. And essentially, the Manticoreans are they're essentially a Western-style democracy, um, and the People's Republic of Haven is essentially a communist star empire. And then the Solarian League, um, so far, and this is the sixth book of the series, and I'm reading them in order. Um, so far, the Solarian League has been mentioned, but they haven't appeared. I think they just kind of keep to themselves, but I know that they, they play a big factor in, in, you know, some of these subsequent novels. Um, there are 19 novels in print. The 20th one I found out actually just yesterday is, is about to go on sale, like on April 4th. And I, I am definitely going to buy that because I absolutely love this series and I love this character. Um, the best way to kind of describe it is, um, as other people have described it, if you're familiar with like the movie Master and Commander, uh, Master and Commander with Russell Crowe, which is also based on a series of books uh, that were written some time ago, the, it's like Master and Commander in space. You know, so there's a lot of, um, you know, it's military science fiction for sure, um, but it's just so well. It's just so well done and it's just so well written and her character is so fleshed out and her character develops and evolves over time and as do the characters around her but a, a lot of people die like a lot of people you get to know them and then they just die because if they're you know they're fighting wars they're they're frequently in battle and the um, the space battle scenes um, are very well written um, you know, it gets into very, you know, a lot of detail about, you know, how the, the spaceships function and the types of weapons they have. And I mean, the, the world building is really top notch in this. And I think that's kind of the appeal to the fans of this series. And there's a lot of fans of this series and of David Weber. Um, and um, and as I mentioned, there are no aliens in this universe except for one. They're, they're called tree cats and uh, tree cats are kind of larger. They're like twice the size of a house cat. And they, they can choose their human um, counterpart. I won't say master because they're on an equal footing. Tree cats have an intelligence pretty much on par with humans. And they form kind of a psychic bond. And so Honor Harrington has a tree cat um, companion. Um, and uh, and the, the cat has its, own, has its own story arc and personality too. So it's pretty cool. I like cats. I like dogs too, but I like cats also. So yeah, I just love these books. And um, I've got, you know, so when I find these, you know, used, you know, I, I'll pick them up for like three bucks or whatever. And I think I've got up to like book, probably up to book 10. So I need to go, I, I'm still kind of, you know, grabbing the other books but um but when that book 20 comes out in a couple of weeks i'm going to grab it hopefully and get maybe an autographed copy of it through barnes and noble and um and um yeah i'm going to get the hardcover first edition of it if i can get one signed i'd I, that yeah i'd be i'd be very pleased with that but i'll i'll have to wait till i read it because i got to read the other books in the in this in the story but i just i just love the honor harrington you know and he's written a lot of other books um outside of her character too. So he's kind of expanded that universe. There's even like a, a companion book, I think it's called House of Steel, um, that, you know, serves as kind of like a, a deep dive into the world building, you know, and that that's pretty cool. I think they need to update it though, because I think they published it like 10 years ago. He's been writing these books, I think, from the, since the early 90s. So uh, amen to him. I, ho I hope he keeps on cranking them out i haven't read any of those books and, and felt like they weren't great you know so uh, let's see switching it up i finished reading this book called notes on complexity a scientific theory of connection consciousness in and being so this is the only nonfiction book i have in this video uh, as you can see i've made 
plenty of notations in the book. So I'm one of these people, like, I won't highlight or underline books. I hate that. I think you're defacing the book. <laughs> yeah, I'm one of those people, you know. Now, sometimes if I if I get a used book and it's it's been mildly underlined and highlighted, I'll still buy it. But I, I've sometimes have bought or had picked up used books for, like, every other paragraph is just like <laughs> with the highlighter and I'm like no I can't handle that it's too distracting for my eyes but so what I do is um, I put these uh, little sticky post-it notes so when I find a paragraph that's interesting to me that's how I mark it you know and and I, I'll know when I go back and look at it like you know, it, even though the line isn't highlighted, my brain will recall why I put a sticky on it. So, um, so, so this book, what is it about? So it's written by a scientist, um, uh, and he is a, uh, let's see, professor of pathology at the New York University Grossman School of Medicine. Um, he is a longtime student of Zen Buddhism. Dr. Thesis studies in complexity theory have led to interdisciplinary collaborations in fields such as integrative medicine, consciousness studies, and the science religion dialogue. Okay, so he's not a physicist um, or like a systems thinker or new um, number theory type guy. You know, he's not he's not a mathematically oriented um, professor. I did recently read another book by that type of professor also on the subject of complexity and it was seriously like one of the most underperforming books on the subject i've ever read but then you have this guy here who who doesn't have the mathematic credentials to write about this subject or some some would say i don't say that you know and he's written an act but his book is excellent on the on this topic so uh go figure you know anyway uh let's see see here in fact I, f I found this to be a more scientific book than the book written by the actual guy who studies complexity from a mathematical perspective <laughs> let's see if I can let's find some interesting comments in here just randomly let's find something boy the pollen is just crazy this time of year isn't it from this idealist view, then, the universe as a whole, including each of our bodies, brains, and minds, is nothing but a manifestation arising from the depths of an underlying consciousness. Space, time, matter, and energy, the quantum foam, all the structures that emerge from these have no inherent existence, but are simply experiences within that consciousness, capitalized. Idealism affirms in the grandest way possible that the brain doesn't make consciousness. It is consciousness that makes the universe, out of which after billions of years, our brains have emerged to be the most complex structure we have yet discovered. And thus, if everything is only a subjective experience of the big consciousness, then the hard problem of what creates subjective experience ceases to be a problem. There is nothing in the universe that is not subjective experience of consciousness. He's speaking about idealism, discussing what idealism is in the field of consciousness. So I enjoyed this book a lot. That's why I made a lot of notes in it. The thing about these, these stickies and, and these notes, so what you do is... Um, if you're interested in a certain study, and, and you might even know this, so I might be like telling you something you already know. But what I do is I, um, you know, I put these stickies in there um, in places that I want to go back and reference, that I think I'll go back and reference, or I, that I think will be interesting to me later on. And so after time, you have, you know, three, four, five, six books kind of on the same subject and you've read them and you've, you've put all these notes in it. Well, then what you do is you take those books and you open them up in front of you. Now, you can do the same thing with a Kindle, you know, or any kind of e-reader using the, the highlighter there. And, and even with that, like, you know, you can, you can um, um, you know, you can copy and paste those into a document or something like that. You know, there's various ways to do it. Um, I just I just don't like I do read 
e-readers sometimes but i prefer analog because it's just it's just easier on my eyes i don't like staring at screens all day long um which is why i've uh i've made steps to eliminate that from my life <laughs> which we won't get into now so um but yeah what you do is and you take those books and then you go through them and then you have you know these uh these sections and so from there, what you have is you have sort of like you begin to have a, uh, a, synthesi a synthesizing of that information from like three or four books on the same topic, which could result. I mean, it depends on what your objectives are. If you're just trying to learn more about a certain topic or if you're uh, if you're writing about these topics, if you're doing blog posts on a certain subject or you're studying, you know, for, for school, for an exam or, or a test or something like that. This is a good way to do it. Now, I am not doing this to study for a test or an exam. I am actually writing about this. So um, that's that's why, um, you know, that's why I, I make these notes and, um, and um, you know, go back and start. You start to make connections is what you do. You know, you begin to make connections. And I, uh, you know, I I've actually will physically take a book stand, you know, and, and stand up this book and I'll like type out the, the particular like the quote that I just read or the paragraph that I read. I'll type that out into a document. Um, this that's kind of a kind of, a, you know, kind of a notebook, basically. And from there, I can begin to sort of analyze, you know, the the. Um, the themes that are shared amongst you know the different books and so forth so the ideas you know and from that maybe you can formulate another idea or <clears throat> have an interesting you know discussion or just dis you know an interesting article can be written um on that topic so it's not it's not plagiarism but it is it's exposing yourself to these chunks of ideas and then synthesizing them into into the written word so um which is something that um, that that AI, I think people are using AI to help them out with that now. All right. Speaking of advanced technologies, so I went to Barnes and Noble yesterday and I picked up this Warhammer forty thousand omnibus God Machines. Um, this is another. One. All these Warhammer omnibuses are beasts of books. <laughs> They let's see, this one is 922 pages long, and the um, font size is about 0.2. <laughs> it's very small font size because these this is essentially, I think, three full novels packed into this one book. Um, but I like these, you know, because it's like you got this, you know, huge book that you can read. The only thing I don't like is the tiny font size, but that just means I increase the magnification of my reading glasses. <laughs> I have to go to a 3.0 for these. Uh, normally, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a 2.5, so I just bump it up, you know. But, um, but even here with these glasses, I can I can still read this at a distance. But yeah, so this is um, th so I don't know much about this little niche of uh, of Warhammer, um, but I believe these are the war machines, or as they call them, the god machines that are employed by the Imperium of Man to fight against the various enemies that they face in the galaxy. Uh, and if you know anything about Warhammer, they face a lot of different enemies, uh, all of them terrible and horrible. <laughs> um, but, you know, let's see this. Let's let's read the synopsis here, because it, it sounds like like the best heavy metal album you've ever heard. <laughs> the Titans and Knights of the Adeptus Titanicus are towering war engines, each an effigy of the Omnisia which I think is supposed to be a, 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 a merging of the word Omni and Messiah. Each an effigy of the Omniscia bristling with weaponry enough to lay armies to waste. For 10,000 years, these behemoths have stood and fought in service of the emperor, 
unleashing righteous might upon the heretic, the mutant and the alien. I mean, just like, you know, just like, just loud, heavy metal. You could put those lyrics, those are lyrics to like a Voivod album. <laughs> And then, and then they go on to tell you about the three books that are that are in this this brick. Um, oh, there's also a novella in it too of short stories. So there's there's three three full length novels and a novella in here. So let's uh, let's in one of them. Let's see in Gav Thorpe's Imperator, Wrath of the Omnissiah, Imperator Titan Cassius Belly must fight the enemy within as well as without, as chaos hordes engulf the forth, forge world of Nicomedua in Knight's Blade and, no, in King's Blade and Knight's Blade, Andy Clark tells a story of knights errant Danielle and Luke who must take control when tragedy strikes on the imperial world of Donatus. And in Warlord, Fury of the God Machine by David Annadale, the Demi Legio of Palladius Moore is sent to save a forge world from the ravages of chaos, but they must put aside their differences with the allies they've been sent to fight alongside. This is like Amon Amar.